Back in late 2015, if you wanted a mid-range CPU for your new gaming PC, the i5-6600K was a pretty clear choice. Sporting the then brand new DDR4 memory, a freshly shrunken process node, and a reasonable enough price tag, it was somewhat the, the go-to chip, even if the previous generation 4670K wasn't exactly all that much slower. AMD was launching their third generation of FX CPUs based on their pile driver architecture, which was fine, but uh, let's say it was far from truly competitive. Now, if we fast forward seven years and we finally have another process node shrink, a major core design change, and actually a major architect shift in fact, and actually even supports for both DDR4 and the newfangled DDR5. The i5-12600K actually boasts a specific yet impressive claim, which is that the four efficiency cores it contains should be as fast, if not faster, than the four Skylake cores in the 6600K while drawing significantly less power. That is an impressive claim, especially considering that the 12600K has a further six hyper-threaded performance cores too. I'm really interested to see how the 6600K holds up against its much younger, I think technically like great, 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 great grandchild, the, the uh, 12600K. So let's start with the gaming results. I'm testing here at 1080p at what I think are realistic settings for each game. So generally somewhere between medium and high. And I'm testing on RTX 3060, as I think that's again, a pretty reasonable choice for, well, either of these chips. So starting with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as I found in my previous video comparing three generations of Intel's 400 series i5s, the newer uh, CPUs like the 12600K and Ryzen 5600X performed functionally identically with only the 10400F lagging slightly behind the rest, but really not by that much. The 6600K though, yeah, that, that took a bit of a hit. Uh, of course, 96 FPS average is still plenty playable, so it's it's no big issue, big, big deal, but compared to the, the rest of the pack, like the 12600K, that's hitting just shy of 150 FPS average, which is a sizable gap. What's also interesting is to look at the CPU render performance, where all of the other chips exceeded their average in-game FPS by a considerable amount, except the 6600K. Microsoft Flight is a pretty similar story. A sizable and noticeable drop in performance using the older i5, albeit still far from unplayable, just shy of 80 FPS average you do have to make sure that nothing else is running in the background though, as those just four cores and four threads are, let's say, stretched pretty thin here. And no game can show that quite as well as CSGO, where <laughs> there was an appreciable difference, not just in the, the, the performance figures, but in the gaming experience too on the 6600K. It nets just 151 FPS average, which on the face of it is still more than enough, but more importantly, the 1% lows dip to just 72 FPS, and I can tell you from my experience playing it that it was stuttering and hitching like mad. It wasn't unplayable or anything, but it was a less than perfect experience for sure. Cyberpunk has a similar trend here too, with a lower but not impossible average and a starkly lower 1% low figure that's a clear indication of a bottleneck. Again, it's still not impossible to play for sure, but it can be a touch on the, the frustrating side at times. Fortnite actually did pretty well here. Again, there was a little bit of, sort of hitching and stuttering while playing, but on the whole, it was uh, perfectly playable with a relatively close 123 FPS average and 63 FPS in the 1% lows. 
it is a fair dip from the, the next lowest 144 FPS average and 103 FPS in the 1% lows, but it's still not that bad. And finally, in Watch Dogs Legion, this takes the cyberpunk approach, but well, kind of even more drastic, especially on the average performance, netting less than half of what the 12600Ks average or what that can offer, and almost a third of the 1% low performance too. Again, while this is still playable for sure, you go from having a, a smooth and responsive and easy to enjoy experience on pretty much any of the other chips to a bit more of a, a choppy, more sluggish time on the 6600K. So with an RTX 3060, 1080p anyway, the 6600K can offer usable, if a little lackluster performance in most titles. It's still perfectly fine but it is clearly showing its age, and an upgrade to even an i5-10400F would offer a sizable performance leap with this class of GPU. But if you thought the gaming results were rough, well, I don't think that you believe some of these. In the single-threaded test in Sony Bench R23, the 12600K offers just shy of twice as much performance. T twice? That's insane! And I think it goes a long way to explaining at least part of the, the gaming performance advantage that the newer chips offer. It's also worth noting that the 10400F is considerably slower uh, in single core performance than the 10600K so that I sadly don't have access to, so it's uh, sort of hence its proximity to the older 6600K. But the real kicker here is multi-threaded, where the 12600K is just shy of five times faster. A combination of both faster single-threaded performance and considerably more cores means that you get light years more performance out of the new chip. Hell, even the 12600, uh, 12400F is two and a half times faster, albeit with six cores and 12 threads at its disposal. In Blender, you can expect the same multiple orders of magnitude performance improvements, with the 6600K taking 11 minutes to render the BMW scene, versus the 12600K at just shy of two and a half minutes. The gooseberry scene is even worse, with the 6th gen chip taking nearly a full hour to render a single frame compared to just under 13 minutes on the 12th gen chip. That limitation continues in the Adobe CC suites as Puget Bench shows well. In Premiere, the 6600K scores at nearly two and a half times lower than the 12600K and, well, a kind of football field behind the rest of the pack too. After Effects is a little closer, just half the score of the 12600K instead, and a little tighter grouping overall. And in Photoshop, well, the gap does close a little more with the 8600K offering only 86% higher score than the 6600K. Interestingly though, even looking at the chip's rated power limits, you'll notice that the 12600K is the highest here, with up to 150 watts of sustained indefinitely power, versus the 91, 95 watts on a 96 second burst on the 6600K, at least on my board, uh, and only the Ryzen 5600X with its 76 watt package power limit cap bests them all. And what's equally interesting, uh, at least for me anyway, is to take a peek at the e core performance on its own. And yep, in Cinebench R23 single threaded, the 12600K's four E cores, or I suppose one E core, offer nearly identical performance to the four Skylight cores in the 6600K. And it goes to the same for multi threaded. In fact, the E cores actually have a slight performance advantage there, all while drawing around 36 watts all core instead of, again, at least on my board, around 45 watts. So it's clear that Intel has come a long way in, well, I suppose seven years. The 12600K, hell, even the much simpler 12400F, offers significantly more performance across the board. 
If you've managed to find a GPU, especially now prices seem to be coming down and stock is generally available, and you've held on to your, you know, something like your 6600K, you might want to consider an upgrade to something like the 12600K, although personally I think that the 12400F is the better bang for the buck option on the, the Intel side right now. Although I should note that the lower your graphics power, the less your CPU will be a bottleneck. So if you're still rocking a 1060 or 1070 or something like that, like a whole lot of people, then a CPU upgrade is definitely less important for gaming. And also the higher the resolution you're playing at, the less important it is as well. I think it is worth noting though that even in my experience with just using the 6600K just for these benchmarks, the whole system felt just slightly more sluggish and, and laggy, unresponsive, just a little bit of a, a less you know, good user experience versus any of the newer chips. I think thanks to both the mix of the faster you know, single core IPC performance, but also the limited number of cores and threads available. I mean, there have been some instances where when I've been testing 6, 8 or 12 core CPUs, I've accidentally left an, you know, a, another game open, just you know, minimized in the taskbar while running uh, another title. Don't worry, I have you know, always uh, caught it and, and re-ran the, the you know, affected benchmarks, but the performance numbers when I do rerun them are often remarkably similar. And that's a whole other game that's just, you know, minimized the taskbar. But I couldn't imagine doing that on something like the 6600K. That's just not even remotely feasible. And even for things like just having your, you know, Discord servers and your, you know, Chrome windows, whatever else, uh, open and running in the background, that is going to be a bit of a performance hit on this style of chip. Anyway, with that said, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, you've heard my thoughts on the, the benchmark results, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think about the 6600K and running it in 2022 and with a, a sort of more powerful, more modern GPU versus would you switch to a, a newer one if you do have this sort of generation of chip? Are you going to stick with yours if you do have one or just anything else? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. I'm going to leave some uh, global Amazon affiliate links in the description to the different CPUs and some GPUs uh, as well if you're interested, including the 12600K and 12400F, so feel free to take a look at those. And there's kind of uh, a load of other ways that you can support the channel, not just using the Amazon affiliate links, but maybe the Overclocks UK one too, if you fancy. You can also just stay up to date on these videos by hitting the subscribe button and turning on the bell notification icon, or checking out plenty of other videos on the end cards. Maybe take a look at the three generations of i5 comparison, I did uh, relatively recently. Otherwise, like I said, there's loads of links in the description you can check out. You can become a YouTube member or a patron with either the YouTube join button or the link to Patreon and get some cool rewards for doing so. Pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs. And well, like I said, feel free to take a look in the description as well. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.